I want to introduce myself. I'm Ronnie Kim. I am the founder of a design and strategic innovation studio called Collective Future. And what we do there is we use future visioning and storytelling and design to help people imagine what's possible uh, and what's possible in their near future and in their immediate future. And it's a question that everyone's got on their mind um, today, I think. And given that, you know, there are a lot of practitioners who have been working in this field, really thinking about futures and really thinking about how to bring different kinds of tools and methodologies and spark imaginations. Um, and so that's why we started this series, the Futures Literacy Series. And we're doing it in conjunction with Speculative Futures LA. I'm one of the organizers and so is Dave Rosell. He's on this, on this call. And the Speculative Futures LA chapter is part of a larger organization. It's a, it's a global one. I think there's uh, over 50 chapters today on all continents uh, or almost every continent. And what we do is, I'll just read it to you. It's meetups focused on speculative and critical design, design, fiction, futurism, and strategy and foresight. So if you'd like to be a part of that community, just let us know. Um, we're happy to, you know, to invite you into the different um, platforms that everyone's on so you can connect with them. Okay, so for our future literacy series today, the reason you're all here, we are so excited to be joined by Dr. Lonnie J. Avi Brooks, and he's going to be speaking about Afrofuturism 2.0 and imagining Afrofutures. And I'm just going to uh, just give him a little bit more of an introdu introduction um, based on his bio. He's got a very incredible um, background and wealth of experience. He is the associate professor in the Department of Communication at California State University, East Bay in strategic communication where he's piloted the integration of futures thinking into the curriculum for the last 15 years. And emerging in recent years as a leading voice of Afrofuturism 2.0, he contributes prolifically to journals, conferences, and anthologies on the, on the subject. And he's also co-executive producer and co-creator with Ahmed Best of the Afrofuturist podcast. I don't know if you guys had a chance to listen to that. It's pretty great. Um, so if you haven't, I'd check it out. He is also the lead organizer in, and creative director in Oakland for the Black Speculative Arts Movement, a national global movement dedicated to celebrating the Black imagination. He has a passion for creating games, envisioning social justice futures, including Black and queer liberation. And he co-designed a game called Afro Rhythms from the Future, which we're gonna be workshopping next week. So I think we're gonna see a lot of you back for that. Um, but if you haven't signed up and you're interested, please do sign up. And lastly, well not lastly, but the last thing on my list here, he also serves as a research affiliate for the Institute for the Future and as a research fellow for the Long Now Foundation. Um, in the spirit of the late Congressman John Lewis, Brooks likes to make good and necessary trouble in the world in the pursuit of democratizing an anti-racist future where Black and BIPOC futures matter. So with that, I want to invite Lonnie, Dr. Brooks, to, to share with us what he's going to be speaking about today. Lonnie. Yeah, hi, everybody. It's just, it's great to be here. Great to get to know Ronnie, and I love... I love just the, you know, the Speculative Futures LA chapter and the Speculative Futures in general has, you know, carried on and grown throughout the world. So it's really, really exciting. And I'm so glad to know Dave, you know, Dave and I have known each other for a, a great while now. And he's just a, like a great ally buddy, uh, fun collaborator. So just, you know, love, love, love <laughs> these folks. So, um, yeah, so I am um, going to be, so first of all, a couple of things. I, um, I don't have the best internet, so at times I may, you know, have a time lag, but other than that, I should be good to go. And the other thing is, I just want to uh, welcome you all. My mom's out there, so hi, mom. <laughs> Glad that she's here today, um, Lori Brooks. So uh, with that, I want to, like, 
go into the presentation um, with kind of a recent talk I did about centering race and anti-racism and forecasting, because for a long time now, um, it just hasn't been addressed widely in the futures field. And there's a whole trajectory around that. I'll just, you know, give a brief blurb about that. You know, futures comes out of, uh, modern futures, you know, comes out of the RAND Corporation in a lot of ways. Uh, it's not just totally the RAND Corporation, of course, but from the American context, it's, it's kind of a military industrial complex approach, but also, you know, you had stuff going on in the counterculture as well and around the world. Um, but it comes out of that context. So, um, you know, at first it had uh, funding from the federal government, lots of funding, in fact. Um, the same man uh, who created the Institute for the Future, Paul Barron, also created the skeletal structure for the internet um, through packet switching. Um, and it was picked up by ARPA in 1968. Um, but that funding also dried up with the rise of the Nixon administration and the closing down of the Congressional Office for um, Technology. And we used to have an Office of Technology Assessment. <laughs> and, uh, and then funding switched to a corporate basis, which in that, in that environment, you know, futures had to prove itself, you know, prove that it can return money on investment and all that stuff. And, and that, I think it really shrinked, shrunk the vision within the American context, at least, of, of futures addressing um, more social issues and especially issues of racism um, in, in the black diaspora, really. So with that, I'm gonna switch on and share my screen um, with, <clears throat> I'm also going to be doing a lot of it on Keynote and then some extra slides through PowerPoint. So there'll be a little bit of transition, but let me go and, uh, and make that transition now. So, I mean, I'll open up my keynote presentation and uh, I'll start playing it. Okay, one of the things I like to do is a land and reparations acknowledgement. Um, I, this is really an important thing to me too, being based in Oakland and on Ohlone land. Um, we have a great team uh, too around Afro-Rhythms from the Future, the game that we'll be playing next week. And some questions that I really wanna uh, discuss here and are, what is astro-blackness? What is Afrofuturism? Looking at radical black art as a futures window and porthole, and tracing the black fantastic in terms of what I call Afro-future types. And also seeing how we're going to be using Afro-rhythms from the future of the game as a tool to center race and anti-racism forecasting. Can everyone see my screen? I just wanna make sure and that you can hear everything. Yep. We can see it. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so let's go um, up. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, there we go. That's our website, Afro Rhythms in the Future, Democratize the Future. And going forward, doing the land reparations acknowledgements for a few minutes too. Um, basically, there's just this. Zagori Te Land Trust um, that's being led by urban indigenous women that are trying to restore the land to the rightful place and sacred relationship to their ancestral lands and that's rematriation. So it's an important uh, concept in my mind to keep a hold of and that it being in the Bay Area, this is a lonely land. Um, let's see. And I am, for some reason my My slides are not cooperating with my pointer, so I'm going to figure it out. And let's see, let's see what's happening. Um, hmm, that is odd. Hold on for a second. Um, Okay, I'm not sure why that's happening. Okay, let me refresh this. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, all right. Let's 
So we are on a lonely land and just acknowledging that is an important um, staple when it give these types of presentations too. Um, and I love that poster, we are still here. And um, so it's Bay Area Native Solidarity in Ohlone Territory. There's this also great book too that I recommend everyone look at too, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World um, called Santak by Tyson uh, Yakopoda out of um, New Zealand. And also honoring the spaces that Black spaces owe to queer culture, or I mean that queer culture owes to Black spaces. The idea of like how drag um, shows of the Harlem Renaissance and Black labor organizations hosting the first gay Mardi Gras balls, and Black gay civil rights leaders creating blueprints for LGBTQ protests, so on. Black Panthers speaking up for gay liberation, and this is a you know um, taken from my uh, great collaborator Leo Herrera, um, who's done a fantastic uh, film called The Father's Project, looking um, at what would have happened if AIDS hadn't happened and gay leaders at the time would have been able to survive and, and flourish. So queer culture does owe a century to Black spaces and Black people. And so that's why I, I just want to make that um, acknowledgement as well. So Afrorhythms from the Future and Centering Race and Anti-Racism and Forecasting. Um, you know, the name of the game, too, comes from the idea that we're situated in algorithms right now, um, you know, in terms of our daily lives. And so the, the game, the title of the game itself is, comes from that. So algorithms, R-I-T-H-M-S, of oppression. And this is a great book, too, by Sophia Noble. Let's see. And Okay. Hmm. Okay, I am. Huh. Today is interesting. I don't know why I've never had this problem before. So <laughs> I am going to see what's happening. That is so odd. I don't know why that's going on. Um, <clears throat> well, let me. Let me see. I'm going to stop sharing for a second and just see what's going on with this. Um, okay, hold on. Okay. All right. Let me continue this. All right. So let's talk about the rise of astro blackness and define that term. And the rise of astro blackness as a person's black state of consciousness released from the confining and crippling slave or colonial mentality who becomes aware of the multitude and varied possibilities and probabilities within the universe. And that's by the Reverend Andrew Rollins, who contributed to Afrofuturism 2.0 in an anthology called Afrofuturism 2.0, The Rise of Astro Blackness. And, you know, it really points to um, how our, 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 greatness as black people arise, our vibranium arises from our need to innovate. Um, you know, if we kind of think of Afrofuturism as a, as, a, as a framework for how black people have always been futurists because we had to be. You know, Afrofuturism aims to reclaim and transform the trauma of past atrocity against the black and Afroqueer diaspora. So if you think about Afrofuturism as a way to augment our ancestral legacies with visions of the future, um, that is part of what Afrofuturism is about. Um, you know, if you also think about the middle passage of slaves being transported from their home world um, in West Africa to a new world in the Americas where they had to really become hybrid innovators in an alien hostile land where if they spoke their languages or played drums um, they could be killed um, and on top of that their foreign religion was imposed upon them so they could not practice their prior rituals and had to find ways to innovate within that framework so they came up with 
spirituals that also, while seeming to pay homage to um, Christianity, also spoke of a new land, Zion, where they could be free of oppression and, and really imagine a, a Wakanda-esque existence of freedom and liberation. So Afrofuturism combines science fiction and fantasy to re-examine how the future is currently imagined and to envision alternative futures based on the Black experience. So Afrofuturism 1.0, um, you know, we could say that it really started with the likes of Sun Ra, the jazz musician in the 1940s, who created this cosmology and mythology of Black people coming from another planet. It spoke to an alienation of Black people on this earth and a way in an ontological space, a space where we could recreate ourselves anew. Um, Afrofuturism was coined by the white critic Mark Derry in the 90s, 1990s, when he was doing an interview with Samuel Delaney and um, Craig Tate and others. And basically, that vision of Afrofuturism 2.0 one you know, in the 90s has far evolved into what we call Afrofuturism 2.0 today. And, you know, with the likes of Alondra Nelson and Sherry Williams and Natasha Womack and others who have expanded what Afrofuturism 1.0 is. So Afrofuturism 2.0 really expands this idea um, where it is not just a literary genre or an an art genre, but it, it's a way of innovating. Um, it's now an academic field. So it's really expanded beyond what was envisioned as Afrofuturism 1.0 with Mark Derry's definition. It's also about tracing the Black Fantastic too. And the Black Fantastic is a term by Richard Eitan. So where Afrofuturism now is transnational, transcontextual, it's diasporic, it's a cultural worldview for interrogating Eurocentric motifs, and that's by Ronaldo Anderson and Tiffany Barber. And it's really expanded into cultural spaces as well. So there's a great exhibition in 2015 called Unveiling Visions, the Alchemy of the Black Imagination. And it was an art and design exhibition sponsored by the Schoenberg Center for Black Research. And, you know, out of this was created the Black Speculative Arts Movement. So it's expanded into uh, looking at cultural spaces, looking at the ways of seeing the world in Afrofuturism 2.0, um, technological innovation as well. Um, so in itself, is become a design framework for thinking about new technology too. So the Black Speculative Arts Movement was born in 2015 and now uh, has launched conferences around the world, what we call festival conferences around the world. Um, and particularly in the last two years in South Africa, in Ghana, in um, Nigeria, in Kenya, and in Europe, in, in Berlin, in, in Germany, in Spain, in, uh, Italy. <clears throat> and so it's also really been embraced by Canada as well. And in the US, BCM festival conferences are happening every year and uh, almost monthly. So radical black art as a futures window. And I'm going to go into what tracing the black fantastic really means here. It's the minor key sensibilities generated from the experiences of the underground, according to Richard Eitan. And that really means about like looking at the margins of society too, looking at folks who haven't had um, a voice about the future as, as much um, or haven't been recognized as having one. But the idea is that black people have always been futurists and have always been had to innovate and look towards the future. So there's a term I coined called future types. Um, we've done an article about this in the Journal of International Communication from USC, but it traces the circulating science fiction capital filled with promises of the future that can simultaneously constrain 
and unleash our imaginations. And so from this, I went to create another term called Afrofuture types that are black signals of the future that find and reclaim the, tra the traces of black cultural visions alongside erasures of those signals. So, you know, when you think about that, you think about um, ideas and visions of the future that we only recently have found out about. And I've talked to this, you know, with some, some of you uh, that are attending today too, but like, for instance, you know, if you've seen the film Hidden Figures, you know, if you hadn't read the book, you wouldn't know that there was these amazing black women engineers and mathematicians that helped chart our journey into space um, in the 1960s at NASA, right? And so there's this kind of reclaiming of black cultural visions that we're doing right now, and also claiming the dystopic ones too, like the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre that we're only recently finding out about. But within that massacre, of those folks was also this treasure of understanding that there was a Black Wall Street, literally called the Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? Where, um, you know, like second, third generation um, folks from slavery were building uh, a treasure trove of wealth for themselves in that city. And then were through, through you know, a, a, a lynch mob, um, because the trumped up charge around um, perceived assault of a white woman, uh, they ended up bombing the city and marching those the survivors um, to a concentration camp to the point where their that vision of the future was erased, right? And so it's so important to really recover and reclaim these traces of black visions. So tracing the black fantastic, you know, is what we see in the um, Black Lives Matter protests uh, in across the land, right, this year, and looking at those signals that have erupted in these protests too, this great art that has happened. And going back to unveiling visions, I love this particular poster from 2015 by Menzel Bozeman. If you get a chance, just buy up everything he does because he's amazing. Um, but it's this kind of sim simultaneity of past, present, and future that I think um, particularly Afrofuturism is interested in investigating. And I just want to say, you know, Afrofuturism is not alone. There's a lot of different types of visions of the future going on right now, like Black quantum futures from um, Philadelphia, uh, led by Rashida Phillips and Mother Moore really great stuff going on there. There's um, Afro-pessimism, another way of looking at uh, the future from, you know, a real um, pessimistic point of view where there's maybe no hope for Black people. Um, but the point of this is, is that the, Af the Black speculative arts movement kind of embraces all these movements and definitions of what Afrofuturism and other types of futures thinking in, in the Black diaspora look like. So Afrofuturism is just one term. Um, it's going to evolve, but it is being embraced in Africa too, uh, in some of the countries I mentioned as Afrofuturism 3.0. You know, how will Africa transform Afrofuturism into its own vision? And it might come up with a totally different term as well. So we're not wed to that term, but it's what we've, we've, what we've um, developed. Um, and then, you know, other signals are this, this issue that I helped to co-edit called When is Wakanda? Um, Afrofuturism and Dark Speculative Futurity. And I love this poster by Stacey Robinson, where he kind of really brings the Black Panther Party and its tenants alive, um, looking at the past and the future. And so this is an issue in the Journal of Future Studies recently from December 2019. Really excited about that issue. If you get a chance to look at the Journal of Future Studies, it's an outstanding um, journal, uh, like global in its scope and really teaches you a lot about futures thinking. Um, there's a great exhibition going on right now in terms of tracing the Black Fantastic called Curating Being in the World by the Black Speculative Arts Movement and sponsored by New York Live Arts. It's in two parts. And if you get a chance to Google it and see the exhibition, it's, it's amazing. Um, you know, this next term I wanna talk about, it's called Finding the Undiscovered Stories. And exactly what I, was talking about too, um, but it has a history. And with W.E.B. Du Bois, 
he did a series of science fiction novels in, uh, or stories called The Princess Still in 1908 to 1910. And, you know, not many people know that he was a science fiction writer as well as being an intellectual thinker around um, the black present and, and past and future. And I just love this. He did this series of portraits, data portraits called Visualizing Black America. And, you know, if we look at them, they look like anything that you could find on the internet in the present. You know, they really look very relevant to what's going on today. So he was looking at the color line at the turn of the 20th century. Um, um, sorry, Lonnie, yeah. can I interrupt for one second? I was just going to say, do you want to try sharing your screen again so that I think you're referencing some images? Oh, did it not show? It didn't oh, show. Gosh. Do you want to try sharing that now? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Yes, I'm so sorry. Wow. No, that's okay. No, no worries. I mean, I think we're all engrossed in what you're saying, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, it's all about the images, though. <laughs> well, if you if you wouldn't mind, then maybe yeah. scrolling back a couple, and we can um, sure. maybe see some of that. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Okay, let me scroll back. Oh man. Yeah. No worries. We have time. <laughs> Yeah, let me redo this all at once. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the rise of astral blackness, there's that definition there. Um, again, the release of a person's black state of consciousness from the confining and crippling slave or colonial mentality who becomes aware of the varied possibilities of the universe. I'm just going to go through this fast, but I want you to see these slides. Yes, thank you. So. <laughs> so basically the point is our vibranium began, you know, um, before and after, but in particular with our spirituals that envisioned Zion. So we have always been futurist and we had to be. So reclaiming and transforming the trauma of past atrocities. And there's that definition in our futurism that I mentioned, you know, combining science fiction and fantasy to examine how the future is currently imagined. And then I talked through around Afrofuturism 1.0, Afrofuturism 2.0, and tracing the Black fantastic. And again, it's transnational and transcontextual. And it's a cultural worldview for interrogating Eurocentric motifs. There's the unveiling exhibitions. I love, love, love this um, poster called Mind Blown, also by Menzel Bozeman. He's just an awesome artist. So many artists in that exhibition, though. So you got you to gotta check it out. That's our, lo our logo for BCM and um, Radical Black Artist Features Window and Chasing the Black Fantastic, that quote from, from Richard Eitan. Future types, Afro-future types. So again, signals of the future that find and reclaim the traces of Black cultural visions alongside erasures of those signals. And then looking at the art from the current protest that is going on, and this is the this is the one um, one of the posters from or paintings from Enzel Bozeman in the Unveiling Visions exhibition too. And again, really honing to the point of the simultaneity of Afrofuturism and Black speculative thought. It's past, present, and future. We look to our ancestral legacies to leverage that ancestral intelligence. And let's see, let me just, hmm. I'm gonna share and reshare again. Sometimes it's stopping and I'm not sure why, but let's go back. Okay, I'm gonna begin here. It's a little glitch today. So again, that's the cover of When is Wakanda, Afrofuturism and Dark Spoken of Futurity. And All that right, was done um, by Stacey. Lonnie, oh, yeah. can you hit the share screen button again? Yeah, sure thing. Okay, can you see that? Yep, there we go. Cool. Okay. So that's the When is Wakanda um, poster and illustration that Stacy Robinson did for a special issue in the journal Future Studies. And just, uh, he's an amazing artist too. And then there's curating the end of the world, um, the exhibition going ongoing by the Black Speculative Arts Movement, and it's in two parts. So I really recommend that you look at that and view it. Um, 
And then finding the undiscovered stories. Again, when I talked about Tulsa and I talked about hidden figures, um, it really comes uh, and can be traced to some of W.B. Du Bois' thought around this, where he, in his Prince of Steel stories about the future, he talked about this instrument called the megascope, where it's looking for undiscovered stories of our Black ancestral lineage and reclaiming those and visualizing them. So this is a great um, piece of art from Tobias Van Veen, a great uh, white ally from Canada and um, amazing, some amazing work there. And what I wanna talk about in terms of uh, John Jennings, he's, uh, some of you may know him, met, met him, he's a great, uh, artist and illustrator of some of the Octavia Butler uh, graphic novels that have been recently come out. And he's also um, heading uh, Apram Comics Arts imprint called Megascope for uh, comics. And he's looking to diversify and reclaim stories of um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color stories through comics. And so that imprint is directed and curated by him, and he adopted the name Megascope in honor of W.B. Du Bois's vision. So just a great, great guy um, and, and, and fantastic work that he's doing. Um, okay, let me uh, see. I don't, okay. For some reason, this is, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll have to share again. Sorry, I'm not sure why this is happening, but it's, it's been, but. <laughs> Um, okay, so centering race and anti-racism forecasting, um, you know. So if you could just hit that share screen again. I think it's like, it must, yeah. be, it must be requiring it twice from you. Right, that must be it. Okay, oh yeah, let me just do that. Okay. Great, thank you. Sure. So, you know, there's a quote in terms of anti-racism, you know, not speaking the truth reinforces racism and allows us to believe it's very normal. So I love that quote. And then, you know, looking at Abram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist really inspires me to think about the future too. And, you know, the way that he talks about it, I think is really interesting because it's about how it's like, racism is like this toxic, toxic disease and that we have to kind of, keep flushing it out and be attuned to it and you know that we have to heal from it so you know anti-racism is this process of unlearning and co-learning engaging and acting and i really want to see how we can center our visions of the future um, through this anti-racist lens <clears throat> and there's a great um indian designer that i'm, I'm quoting from and um, I will get her name and, and uh, give you a link to her work later. But I like how what she says, she's recently in an Adobe Design Conference where she talked about how we must look at how we, how we can design in the present for impossible but necessary futures. We must look for opportunities to experiment, build unexpected community, and create tenderness in a time of deep violence. And it's a call to innovate as our species face one of its most volatile inflection points. It's where design becomes the active exercise for hope. And I love this woman. I completely forgot her name, but I will link you to her work later. She's amazing. So um, also, I'm giving a nod to Woodrow Wilson, where he talks about designing from the margins, offers a pathway for grappling with notions of inclusion and equity within technological design and development. So he gave a great talk at Primer 2020 about um, humanistic design um, and inclusive design. So Afro Rhythms from the Future as the portal for unveiling visions is the game you know, that we co-created too. And it's one of the spaces that we're creating for anti-racist futures. So we begin with this first space before I go into talking about the game is the Afro Futures podcast. And you know, I got to know Ahmed when his brother-in-law uh, texted me uh, a, a, like two and a half years ago and said, oh, my brother-in-law would like to talk to you about Afrofuturism. And by the way, he played Jar Jar Binks in Star Wars. And I was like, oh, okay. 
<laughs> so we we met, we hit it off, and he suggested that we start a podcast together, and we called it we call it the Afrofuturist Podcast. And it's around really examining and speculating and imagining the future from a global point of view. So we're building a community that showcases diverse ideas of the future through um, various perspectives, you know, people who are traditionally not heard from and where we're trying to democratize the future. You know, when I turned 50, <laughs> I realized that, you know, our institutions were insufficient to the task of envisioning the future for Black people. And that's why I was inspired with Ronaldo Anderson in creating, um, when he created, co-founded the Black Speculative Arts Movement. And I wanted to help expand that and contribute to it in whatever ways I could. So the Afrofuturist podcast is one type of uh, channel that we've created. And, you know, it's not alone, but I love that, like, we've also created this Afrofuturist um, podcast network, too. Um, okay. So um, let me, let me just see what's, um, huh, okay. I will. I'm going to share my screen in a minute. I'm just going to try to go forward here for a second and having some um, issues today with the keynote. So I'm going to have to see what's going on there. But let me get back to sharing the screen with you. And somebody wrote so, an. Oh, there you go. Somebody also wrote a note. If it doesn't work, you can also just kind of manually sc scroll through the screens because it looks like we can see that as well. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Too. Yeah. You know, again, I want to come back to where we're creating, we were creating Sonic Utopias. It didn't stop with spirituals, but, you know, Sonic Utopias as a form of as envisioning future scenarios, envisioning Zion. So we are vibranium. And a nod to my good and great collaborator, Amos White, who together we have um, really discussed and defined Afrofuturism. Um, okay, let me uh, see. It. Okay. For some reason, this is, I'm going to stop sharing. I'll have to share again. Sorry, I'm not sure why this is happening, but it's, it's been, but. <laughs> Um, okay. So centering race and anti-racism forecasting, um, you know. So if you could just hit that share screen again. I think it's like, it must, yeah. be, it must be requiring it twice from you. Right. That must be it. Okay. Oh yeah. Let me just do that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Sure. So, you know, there's a quote in terms of anti-racism, you know, not speaking the truth reinforces racism and allows us to believe it's very normal. So I love that quote. And then, you know, looking at Abram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist really inspires me to think about the future too. And, you know, the way that he talks about it, I think is really interesting because it's about how it's like racism is like this toxic, toxic disease and that we have to kind of keep flushing it out and be attuned to it and you know that we have to heal from it so you know anti-racism is this process of unlearning and co-learning engaging and acting and i really want to see how we can center our visions of the future um, through this anti-racist lens <clears throat> And there's a great um, Indian designer that I'm, I'm quoting from, and um, I will get her name and, and uh, give you a link to her work later. But I like how what she says, she's recently in an Adobe design conference where she talked about how we must look at how we, how we can design in the present for impossible but necessary futures. We must look for opportunities to experiment, build unexpected community and create tenderness in a time of deep violence. And it's a call to innovate as our species face one of its most volatile inflection points. It's where design becomes the active exercise for hope. And I love this woman. I completely forgot her name, but I will link you to her work later. She's amazing. So um, also, I'm giving a nod to Woodrow Wilson, 
where he talks about designing from the margins offers a pathway for grappling with notions of inclusion and equity within technological design and development. So he gave a great talk at Primer 2020 about um, humanistic design um, and inclusive design. So Afro-Rhythms from the Future as the portal for unveiling visions is the game you know, that we co-created too. And it's one of the spaces that we're creating for anti-racist futures. So we begin with this first space before I go into talking about the game is the Afrofuturist podcast. And, you know, I got to know Ahmed when his brother-in-law uh, texted me uh, a, a, like two and a half years ago and said, oh, my brother-in-law would like to talk to you about Afrofuturism. And by the way, he played Jar Jar Binks in Star Wars. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so we we met, we hit it off, and he suggested that we start a podcast together and we called it we call it the Afrofuturist podcast. And it's around really examining and speculating and imagining the future from a global point of view. So we're building a community that showcases diverse ideas of the future through um, various perspectives, you know, people who are traditionally not heard from and where we're trying to democratize the future. You know, when I turned 50, <laughs> I realized that you know, our institutions were insufficient to the task of envisioning the future for Black people. And that's why I was inspired with Ronaldo Anderson in creating, um, when he created, co-founded the Black Speculative Arts Movement. And I wanted to help expand that and contribute to it in whatever ways I could. So the Afrofuturist podcast is one type of uh, channel that we've created. And, you know, it's not alone. But I love that, like, we've also created this Afrofuturist um, podcast network, too. Um, okay. So um, let me let me just see what's... Um, huh, okay. I will... I'm going to share my screen in a minute. I'm just gonna to try to go forward here for a second and having some um, issues today with the keynote. So I'm gonna to have to see what's going on there. But let me get back to sharing the screen with you. And somebody so, wrote an, oh, there you go. Somebody also wrote a note, if it doesn't work, you can also just kind of manually scroll through the screens because it looks like we can see that as well. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think Thank so you. too. Yeah. You know, again, I want to come back to where we're creating, we were creating Sonic Utopias. It didn't stop with spirituals, but, you know, Sonic Utopias as a form of as envisioning future scenarios, envisioning Zion. So we are Vibranium. And a nod to my good and great collaborator, Amos White, who together we have um, really discussed and defined Afrofuturism in terms of vibra our vibranium. Um, I also want to talk about, um, for a minute, a quick minute, about where there's this overlap of Afrofuturism and queer, queering the future, where queer people don't grow up as ourselves. We grow up playing a version of ourselves that specifies that sacrifices authenticity to minimize humiliation and prejudice. So the massive task of our, our adult lives is to unpick which parts of ourselves are truly us and which parts were created to protect us or that we've created to protect us. And I think it really speaks to this double consciousness that W.B. Du Bois talks about where um, you know, we, we see ourselves authentically in one space, but have to see ourselves through the eyes of white people and others who don't value our lives. And so, you know, queer people have gone through this process as well. And so um, my work, um, I'm doing another piece, a chapter on queering futures with Afrofuturism. And so it's a really important chapter to me uh, about kind of looking at the intersections of this and really being, um, you know, how do, how do we create liberating futures for all? Okay, so I will take your advice there and um, uh, go forward. Okay, well, let's see. I'm going to pause for a second. What I wanted to do was 
play a video of our game. We're going to see the video next week too, but I'm going to play this video of our game so you get a sense of what Afro-Rhythms in the Future is about. And so we did this at Neuhaus last year on May 22nd. So uh, listen to it. Here we go. Hopefully, can everyone hear it or see it? We can yeah. see it, yeah. We can, we can see everybody. Okay, great. We all have agency over what the future can bring. Each of us individually can shape not only our personal future, but the future that we all live in. And the object of tonight is to get you to imagine. We want to get you to get out of the frame of reference of what you think your future might be and get as creative as possible. And we're going to see what we can build using that imagination and speculative thought. And we might come up with some cool stuff. So there are people who have tension cards. These tension cards are going to establish the parameters of our universe, and we're going to choose two cards. Let me see, uh, raise your hand if you have a tension card. All right, all the way back there. More or less black feminist leadership. More or less black feminist leadership. Who else has a tension card? More or less social justice. More or less social justice. So now that we have the parameters of our universe, we have created four multiverses that we can live in all along the spectrum of those two choices. So now you guys in your chairs, you have inspiration cards. All right, let me see, what is your inspiration card? Oh, I have fashion. Okay, fashion, I like this one, I like fashion. What would be an article of fashion that would give you more black feminist leadership and more social justice? Yes. I was just thinking about the notion of the invisibility cloak, but also like to have it be reversed, like it can make you invisible, but it can also make you more visible, amplifying like what you normally So an amplification cloak. A Go. Bodysuit. A bodysuit. What does this bodysuit do? <laughs> How about a bodysuit that repels emotional damage? Oh. oh shit. Okay, here we go, y'all. Let's go. Let's go. So we have a bodysuit that when anything emotional tries to come and get you, it repels it. How could it be dystopian? Dictators could use it. That's How so? If they're not feeling emotional damage, then there's no consequence to society. So it feels like it could be a very negative thing to have a suit. Right. So that could be dystopian. Okay, I need another inspiration, another object. Inspiration, queer liberation. Queer liberation. Object, who has an object? Object, 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 here. Buttons. Buttons. You can press a button to change your gender. Oh. A gender shifting button. Who's with that? Yeah. The button should be more like, you're more on a spectrum. It's more fluid. Yeah, it's more like post-binary. It's not binary. So what if the button is just like, it just regulates you through your queer liberation? It's a dial. It's not a button, it's a dial. Right? Research has shown that we can create alternative memories that heal trauma. And how do we heal the trauma of 400 years of oppression? How do we heal any personal trauma that we've had individually? Uh, collectively, and how do we create alternative memories of the future that pull us in and create resiliency for everybody? So we see this game as potentially available in schools, uh, colleges, I played it with my students. I like playing it with students also because, especially your students of your Afrofuturism course, they want to be creating their own cards and their own ideas that they're putting into the game, so it's not just using what we've given them, but adding to it. Let it become uh, a democracy of the future for everyone, available to everyone.
Okay, let's see. So I'm going to see if I can just go to one last slide. Well, I'll just show it on my on my um, on my other screen. Hold on for a second. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to my last um, screen here. I'm gonna just give you this last screen and show it to you. So hold on real quick. Um, and here we go. Let's see. Thank you all. You've been nice. <laughs> So this last screen is just to say that um, our Afro Rhythms from the Future game will launch um, at the beginning of October. And it's really about shifting the lens, democratizing and imagining anti-racist futures where Black futures matter. Um, and we have our website, which is AfroRhythms.com. So you can go there and check it out. And then our Afro Futures podcast network is here. Um, and I'll, I'll send those links along with, uh, with Ronnie so you can, you can look at those. And click on those and also our our afro futures podcast is on itunes too so let me stop sharing and um we can go to some uh, q a so thanks again for your patience <laughs> keynote had a mind of its own today but anyway. <laughs> thank you so much for leading us through that lonnie that was amazing i learned so much and I mean, in particular, I really love the framing of uh, the way that you frame Black people and in innovations. And, you know, we typically think of innovations in the context of tech and business, but the way that you talk about innovations in terms of culture and identity and freedom is really, really interesting. Um, and I also really, um, I made a bunch of notes. I'm just kind of... <laughs> pulling some of them out, but this idea of connecting past, present, and future and reclaiming ancestral intelligence. Um, because I think that there is a part of this practice where when there's so much happening at once, when there's not just so much uncertainty, but so much change, people aren't always sure where to go. Um, and being able to really, you know, have these different kinds of, um, guideposts you know that have always existed and really bringing that to the foreground and giving you know creating that space of imagination and play within that um seems you know it just seems really productive and really creative and uh, i could see how that is you know there's just a whole field of possibility there uh, yeah yeah go ahead yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. Like the idea is really, um, and there's so many undiscovered stories, right? Right. I mean, you know, and um, yeah, just that part. I mean, just real quickly, like there was a CNN report of that even before, um, you know, the United States was created, that millions of Native Americans had died through pandemics with the arrival of the Europeans in, you know, 1492, right? And they've known this, they, they found this out through ice cores, that there was an emission of CO2 because of untended land that had come up. And just the idea that we have gone through the apocalypse, like multiple times as different peoples, mm. is, is where, you know, I want to find the un these undiscovered stories. Um, and, and how do we recover these cosmologies of seeing the world that we've yeah. lost. Yeah, and you have so many great references. For sure, I'd love to be able to share those with um, with everyone when I, I'll send a follow-up email so that people can access both the recording, but also um, those different references that you have. Um, so we did receive uh, quite a few questions um, as people were signing up. So maybe I'll just start with those. And then if anyone else has any and you want to throw them into the chat, please do. Um, so one of the one of the questions had to do with how to do the work of Afrofuturisms as a non-academic. And can you talk a little bit about how that translates into practical real world um, effects? How you yeah, see that I working? Mean there's plenty of innovation going on outside of academia. In part, that's what's kind of motivated me to go outside of academia too. Because <laughs> I, I love, you know, I love design, I love art. And of course that's in academia, but you know, there's so much innovation that, that happens. Like Thaddeus House, he's, he does amazing um, uh, literary work 
uh, and he, you know, he doesn't come from an academic um, uh, degree, right? Uh, it, but he's just prolific and amazing. And so there's these uh, groups of literary artists and art um, and and artistic visual artists, uh, designers um, that you know are doing things outside of the realm of academia. And that's where the Black Spaghetti of Arts movement is so important because it brings together and converges, it's a convergence of people from outside of academia celebrating the Black imagination. So I think it's, uh, it's you know, attending conferences like that uh, and conference festivals like that, um, seeing other institutions where you can join and contribute. Um, there's so many calls just in the past month for um, creations that, you know, just are lie outside at the academic realm. So, you know, I can give you pointers and links to those as well um, to pursue, so. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, yeah, oh, that would be amazing. Um, yeah, because a lot of people did. Gonna, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. We're gonna be curating, Ahmed and I are curating uh, what we call Red, Red Spring. It's a, a curating the end of the world exhibition in the springtime. So we're gonna have a call for that soon and uh, we'll let you know. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was just gonna say that there's a lot of people that was asking for it, that were asking for more literature and you know, just a, like ways to um, stay engaged with this. Um, there's a question by uh, Eva, are you there? I'm here. Hi, Eva. Do you want to ask uh, your question? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, Lonnie, thank you so much. That was just such an incredible talk, and you presented so many concepts that I just really haven't thought about before, um, and just introduced like my mind to. It just really expanded my mind. So thank you so much. I actually want to like hear it again and see it again with all of the images as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've been, um, in, during the pandemic and during this year, I've been reading um, Octavia Butler's parable book, The Parable of the Sower, now Parable of the Talents. Yeah. And I'm so, so just blown away by her books and also that she wrote them 20 years, like over 20 years ago, um, and just how prescient and relevant they are and just her perspective. And I just... I would just love to hear your thoughts on her work, like in the context of this year. And um, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, too, um, you know, Atima Butler is amazing, right? She's talking, you know, Parable of the Sower, uh, you know, takes place in the 2020s with a dysfunctional president. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then she's, you know, her, the main character has this empathic ability that can also be a disability in some ways, but mm -hmm. like, you know, it's this empathy that allows her to, um, you know, create and galvanize this community to escape up north and to mm -hmm. form and reform their own community. And just the way that she kind of interprets and reinterprets God as kind of an innovative force in our lives too is like really amazing mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. well. So uh, I, I think it's a breathtaking vision. Um, I signed it in my the first uh, course I taught on Afrofuturism. And like my students are coming up to me and like, I finished that in three days, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's an inspiring, I mean, and it was tougher for me to finish it than them because it was so, it was bleak in some ways, you know, of course, with mm -hmm. the dissolution of, of American society and, and, and hard to see, you know, what to anticipate, right? What, how do we see what's, hap what, what's gonna happen with the election and after the election and mm -hmm. all that, you know? So, I just think that she is a goddess. You know, mm -hmm. Octavia Butler is a goddess. And in mm -hmm. fact, Karen Zanarofru, uh, an artist here in the Bay Area, created an exhibition called Black Women as God, you know, mm -hmm. uh, really looking at, at that. And so, I mean, Octavia Butler is just, um, there's a great book called Octavia's Brood, um, mm -hmm. where it's looking at science fiction as a lens to reframe and understand social movements. Mm -hmm. So it's really great, great work. To, oh, to check that out. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's almost like she's like, to, yeah, it's almost like God knowledge, I mean, of just, just predicting and I mean, in so many specifics, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like she just, you know, what you're talking about with, you know, Afrofuturism, and I, I just, she so embodies 
so much of what you're speaking about. It's just, um, anyway, so thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, sure, sure thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's a good example of recovering um, and recreating a new cosmology. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Bonnie. I'm curious if you're finding a lot more interest right now in Afrofuturism 2.0. I imagine you are. And just the kinds of, I'm, I'm interested in um, sort of how we can support these visions and or, you know, what it is that you feel like you need in terms of being able to um, make these platforms more available to people or sharing these ideas. Because I think the, it's just such a wealth of, of, you know, of information and ideas the way that Eva was just speaking to. Um, so I'm curious what, you know, what you've been encountering and what you've been finding in, in, you know, in your, in your, um, as you're talking about it and sharing it out. Yeah. I mean, I think with, you know, the, the, the protests that have occurred, the uprisings that have occurred, um, it, it brings a wealth of, like, well, how, how do we get things, you know, and so a couple of that is the need for more future visions. So, yes, I found myself, you know, <laughs> uh, tap, you know, people tapping into and, and wanting to, to talk with me and others, of, of other of my colleagues as well. And so really, um, oops, really thinking about um, how, how do you, how do we contribute to this? And I think, um, one of the ways is through the game that we're doing um, and really wanting to distribute that so that folks can kind of create their own vision of the future too. So that's one avenue. Um, we're also creating a community future school at the Museum of Children's Arts uh, that just got approved for two years of funding by the Blue Shield Foundation. So that's really exciting where we're going to take a cohort of 14 to 24 year olds and they're going to, um, play the game after rhythms in the future, learn about strategic foresight and build their own games envisioning the future as well. So we're gonna be partnering with um, game heads with Damon Packwood and with Ancestral Futures with Audrey Williams and Jade, Jade um, uh, Jasmine um, Wade. And so um, really, really excited about, about that. I think, you know, attending conferences, tuning into these types of events, um, supporting these events with donations, um, you know, finding more ways of bringing the game into your institutions, for example, would really be helpful. So we're working yeah. with organizations as well. Um, we're working with the Oakland School of the Arts and their Fashion Academy in bringing in Afrofuturism and curriculum. So that's another really interesting way. And, and with the, the way the schools are online right now too, there's this opportunity to really build Afrofuturism curriculum um, to fill in some of the gaps. And so that's really exciting. Um, yeah, and um, there's also a comparative ethnic studies uh, anthology that will be coming out soon too, where it's gonna be talking about love and decolonization. And I'll have a chapter in that. Um, there's lots of uh, lots of things going on. We have uh, a, uh, anthology on Afrofuturismo and how Afrofuturism is being expressed in Latin America as well, and that'll be out next year. Um, so just a wealth of uh, of opportunities and ways to get involved. I think that again, I can you know put in that those links that I sent to you uh, to. So we we are launching the California Blacks Bucket of Arts Movement as a nonprofit that will link up efforts of the Bay Area and Los Angeles as well as we sponsor and continue to sponsor our, our festival conferences there. So, you know, attending those and, you know, if you're close by to those locations really helps. Okay, fantastic. I remember um, one of the first time we talked, you, you shared a vision around um, being able to create these imagination labs sort of all across the country. And as an educator, you know, being able to create these schools or in incorporated into um, curriculums where people really learn how to be imaginative and to, uh, you know, incorporate these different ideas. Because I think, unfortunately, it's so new to a lot of people. And yet it's, you know, it's part of our heritage and it's part of 
um, something that everyone can do. Um, and so I've, that, that thought has really stayed with me. Um, exactly. we're, so yeah, that's part of the, the, the vision that we're doing in trying to carry out with Blue Shield is creating an imagination network of California too. So uh, IFGF has created this network called the California Equitable Futures Network too. So we're trying to kind of merge our visions together as well where you know every you know um, traditionally marginalized group can showcase their vision of the future and translate that into programmatic visions uh, in the community and uh, legislative agendas uh, and policy. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, sadly, we have reached the top of the hour, but the good news is we have Lonnie back with us next week. Um, and as I mentioned, as Lonnie mentioned, we're going to be workshopping the Afro Rhythms of the future game. So if you haven't already signed up or if you know somebody who may be interested, uh, get in touch with us or, you know, a lot of you have already, um, uh, we've added you to the, to the attendee list, but please feel free to share that with people. And I just have a couple other quick, um, let's see. I just wanted to share this screen, which has some of, whoops, which has some of Lonnie's links, but as I mentioned, we will send it um, via email to all of you so that you're able to access both his website. Um, this is the Afro Rhythms of the Future game. You can follow, follow Lonnie on Instagram and we will also be sending out the video recording to everybody who, um, who was on the list. So thank you again and we really loved having you here and Lonnie, thank you so much for spending some time with us and helping us to understand what what all of this is about how to participate in the conversations and to um and to just become more literate and intelligent about afro future futures thank you so much and i'm i'm also at, on twitter as at avilani as well so okay uh, yeah welcome welcome everyone to to share your ideas with me and uh thank you thank you for having me on this has really been fun uh, despite the technical glitches. I really enjoyed myself. So thank you. Hope you did too. Thanks, we love having you. Thank you. <laughs>